here in this Easter season, we are following Paul. And so we began with that conversion and talked about conversion experiences um, in all of the different forms that they come in and present themselves in, not just Paul's, but the Ethiopian eunuchs and then Cornelius, the Roman centurions as well in that first portion of the book of Acts. And Bill was here last week to share with us the church fasting and praying and hearing from the Holy Spirit to set Paul and Barnabas apart and send them off in mission. And so we pick up there with them staying in Antioch in the set apart and the sentness um, while there are others who have stayed at Jerusalem and the church is at work. And as the church is at work and as life is happening, conflict arises. And we have this moment in scripture of one of the first formational moments of of a theological disagreement and of a discernment process for dis deciding who the church is going to be and again as i've added at the beginning of every sermon thus far we need to remember that there is no christianity yet um, we are still completely in the time period where everything is based in judaism and these are just simply jews who have decided that jesus christ is the messiah versus jews who have not made that decision and don't believe that he is and so when scripture references pharisees being a part this is all of the different um, leadership positions and different groups within Judaism are still within um, this time period too in terms of the followers of the way, in terms of the followers of Jesus Christ. And so we have all of that happening in this mix, but again, no Christianity yet. So we're not in different religions and wanna make that clear in terms of, cause it's very easy um, to get into what the first heresy was and the anti-Semitism to completely do away with all of the Hebrew Bible because that is not needed at all. Um, and that just the New Testament and Jesus Christ is all that we have moving forward. And the fact that that was named a heresy and the fact that that was guarded against comes straight to this first fight and what James laid into position and how the leadership responded to this moment and paved the way for us moving forward. One of my favorite things about scripture is how honest it is. One of the favorite gifts is being able to go and read through and find out how our fathers and mothers of faith responded in faith in critical moments like this. The fact that we have documentation of tension, of conflict, of people and heroes of faith not quite living into the fullness of that faith and, and what God has called them to be as we studied way back last year with King David. All of these are gifts for us and for how we live out our faith today, to learn from our ancestors and where this worked and where it didn't work so that we can carry on in their legacy here and now. I have a mentor who talks about conflict and fights, um, not just in church, but in general, and says, you know, until Jesus comes again, there's always going to be a fight or a conflict or a problem somewhere. That's just the way the world is. There's this law of the universe called entropy, where all things tend toward disorder. So at some point, there's going to be a problem. Um, it's not that we're not ever going to get to a utopia where there's no problems. He's like, my goal in life is to get to the point where it's quality problems, um, problems that are at the heart of the matter of who we are and that we're not wasting the tension and the conflict and the intensity of digging in and deep calling to deep and iron sharpening iron in the trivial superficial stuff that we're at least our problems are real and we're making them count. In premarital counseling, we talk about this in terms of fighting fairly and how a good fight, when done well, when done in love, can bring two people closer together than an entire period of no tension and no conflict. Because this is when we are vulnerable. This is when what matters most to us is at stake. It's the refining fire of knowing what must never change and what can change. 
These are the moments that God can use to bring forth that fruit and that flowering that we just prayed for in the offering prayer. And so, and so we have the early church. We have the Holy Spirit calling and everyone understanding that call to set Paul and Barnabas aside and send them in a missionary journey. And we need to remember that that Holy Spirit didn't call everybody in Jerusalem to just pick up and go. There were different calls for different people. And as those different calls get lived out, and as those different calls take root, different things begin to happen. Different needs begin to surface. Different truths are formed. And what is urgent for one group of folks, with Paul and Barnabas working primarily with Gentiles in their mission, is not the same urgency or the same need for the church in Jerusalem working primarily with Jews. And here's the beautiful, miraculous part of this. Antioch sends Paul and Barnabas and others back to this council to have this question out, to settle it once and for all. And two different truths meet, and two different truths listen to each other. And that is where I want the gospel to be lived out today. Because just because there's different truths doesn't mean that one isn't true, or it doesn't mean that one isn't urgent. And what James and the leadership in Jerusalem were able to do was listen to the personal experience of Paul and Barnabas as they told their story. And that story wouldn't have been the stories that they were experiencing themselves in Jerusalem in a very different setting with very different challenges and problems and successes and excitements of it, their own. But what this early church council did was make room for both realities. And they did that from listening to one another and what the Holy Spirit was already accomplishing, right? We're going to get into a Wesleyan quadrilateral. Confirmation's happening right now for our youth and retreat, so we're going to have a little bit moment here in solidarity. And so as we come into these moments of conflict and we're trying to figure out our way forward, we're listening to the personal experience. And we're using reason to look through, well, if the holy, this is part of the discussion that um, Alexa noted um, that was happening that we didn't read the whole scripture through for, but part of um, the discussion that ha happened in terms of the reason, if God is doing this, then who are we to stop God? The reasoning that goes through. And then the tradition, right? Because we remember back to God's vision to Peter and to baptizing Cornelius and all of Cornelius' household. It doesn't get much more Gentile than a Roman occupying force centurion being brought into the faith. That was funny, guys. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really big extreme, all right? So if you can do it for Cornelius, and if that works out, then okay, that's a moment. And that's what James referenced, right? So we're standing on the tradition and the legacy that is already in place. And above all, we go to Scripture. We go to Scripture with the information from reason and tradition and personal experience. And James finds that scripture in Amos, in the Hebrew Bible, and the call to expand. And then there's this beautiful compromise that's reached, right? Because we have the already and the not yet. We have the perfect world that we would love, and then we have the real world that we need to account logistics for, and, and the both and and the back and forth, and, and the, the non-perfection. And so we have this beautiful theological moment of call and of grounding from scripture um, to include the Gentiles, affirming the personal experience of Paul and Barnabas from their call from the Holy Spirit to go to mission. So now we have this clear moment of who we are theologically, who we are idealistically, right? That's been brought together from scripture, from personal experience, from reason and tradition. 
but there's still some, some rub in the interpersonal relationships and the practical side of things that we need to take care of. And James addresses that in, in the four stipulations, that yes, we are a Jewish movement and we need to include Gentiles, but there's going to be some areas that that's going to produce more conflict than in other areas. So if the Gentiles can also honor who we are and where we come from and the truth of Moses, and that was that last line of scripture, then I think we can make this work. And so there is give and take. There is learning to walk together loosely. There is giving room for both truths, not just ideologically and theologically, but in practically and how it gets lived out every day. We've done it before. We can do it again, church. This is our call. It was God who called Paul and Barnabas into mission that brought this dust up into place in the first place. And it was God's call that kept those leaders, James and Peter, in Jerusalem and ministering. Both, all, and are needed. And this church council was able to find a way for the both and not just ideologically, theologically based on scripture, but practically as well. This is our call, to live from a point of abundance and not of scarcity. That because your truth is different than mine, I have to reject it and you, or fully adopt it and you. There is room for both and. And the fact that James set this room in place and didn't um, just give everything away in terms of welcoming the Gentiles in, but kept some boundaries around the law of Moses is what then kept the early church safe later on when Marcion came and was ready to reject all of Hebrew Bible and scripture. Because that tradition was set, because that foundation was set, that preserved once again truth a couple of centuries later. This is what we build off of from one another. This is the legacy that we give of lives lived in faithfulness because we're human. And it's never going to be a nice, neat, linear progression. Peter had the vision that God wanted Gentiles to be included and baptized Cornelius, and a few chapters later in the same book, in the same early church, the question is up yet again. Like, I thought we already settled this. And then a couple centuries later with Marcion, it's going to come up yet again. I thought we already settled this. But that is the way, <laughs> until Christ returns, of creatures that are finite and that are limited. And that is what happens when other spiritual forces of wickedness and powers of evil get in the way of our focus on God and what God wants. And these questions will come up again, and they'll be slightly different for a slightly different context. It is our call and our responsibility to stay anchored in scripture to listen to the personal experiences of others, to use reason, and to use the legacy, the tradition of our fathers and mothers and parents of faith as we continue this journey. This was a phenomenal gift of a moment. May we not waste the conflict that is before us. May we grow from it, may we learn from it, May it bring about a new beginning that is based in God's abundance, that is based in God's call, knowing that we don't share the same call, knowing that we are not all called to the same places, but the same God and the same spirit and the same baptism that unites us all has room for all of these calls. Amen. As we commit to living out our call this week. Listen to someone's experience. Get a wider vision of what God is doing and how God is at work in a place that's different from your own and your own call. And celebrate that and learn from it. May we 
do so this coming week, specifically here at Epworth with our comfort bands from their retreat. Take time to ask them to listen to their experience, to hear what this journey and what this process has been like, what they've learned, what they're excited about, what they're anxious about. They are a part of our family and let's hear that truth and let's let that truth and that call call us forward as well. Would you rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn, Let All Things Now Living with... <laughs>